Welcome to the Dr. Jimbo Love Show uh, featuring Seth Matthew. Hey everybody. All right, we are here today, Saturday morning at Brothers Bar and Grill in the shops of Northfield up in the mezzanine section. Look over our shoulder. We want to thank Ford Motor Company for uh, being one of our title sponsors for the show today and for sending us that sign. Nothing runs like a Ford. <laughs> We're just teasing. One of these days, Ford will be approaching us. That's our goal. Uh, we had a big night last night in hockey. Oh, everything went great last night, except for one team. But everything like was well, just great. Well, the Avalanche game. did extremely well and came back from a three nothing deficit. I'm not going to try to kill us our, oh. our, our preview, but yeah, that was that was pretty crazy. Unbelievable. And people, you know, I was on Twitter last night and people were just blowing up and and giving uh, the Avs all this trouble. And here, come to find out, they come back and they win, and it was a big win, right? Six to three. Yeah, and I, I was wrong. I thought Nathan McKinnon was going to be out with a lower body injury. He did end up playing, and he contributed. They were looking tough as ever last night. He just turned that up, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you guys, we don't have our microphone today, so just please bear with us. We're doing the best we can. We're going to be as loud as we can. Um, we had the radio turned down a little bit, but uh, that's okay. You're gonna, we're going to talk loud and um, hopefully it'll come across as well as possible. Um, DU, not so good. No. Okay, they were down four zip in the second period, never recovered, and ended up with a five to one loss at Nebraska Omaha last night. I mean, it just showed that Magnus Cronus is human. He's fallible. And, but the huge thing with this game is Nebraska Omaha is on a tear. They just swept St. Cloud State. Yep. They're making their push. Honestly, I would be terrified to run into them in the NCHC tournament because they're getting hot at the right time. They really are, and you called it. Yeah. You called it on the preview, and he said, even Seth said, he thought this could possibly be a tough game for DU. Well, guess what? It was more than a tough game, game and they got crushed. Yeah. So, it's, And overall, I mean, Denver's really big struggles are they really need to capitalize on their power plays. When they played St. Cloud State, when they played Duluth, their power play was working. And they went 0 for 5 on power plays against this Nebraska Omaha time. So, I mean, you had 10 minutes with a man advantage and you didn't come up with at least one goal. That's just a rough start for that team. Well, you got to remember, Omaha is 2013 and 0, whereas you've got DU that's 22 8 and 1. Now, what really uh, I couldn't believe were the shots on goal. Remember, we've talked about this DU squad, and they're getting, you know, 40 plus shots on goal. Well, they yeah. only had 32 shots on goal last night. Omaha had 27 shots on goal, and you know, Corona looks like he had a little bit of a rough time there in that first period. They were down three zip. Yeah, and I always give the edge to like traveling teams. I always say that they might lose the first game, especially in these college series where they're two games back to back. That first game going on the way, you just traveled, you did your skate through, but your intensity might not be there. So away games are really tough on these two game series. So I expect Denver to bounce back, but you know, this Omaha team's really surprised me right now because they've been hovering around that 20 spot and now they're back into it. They fell off for a second and then they swept St. Cloud State and now they beat Denver. If they sweep Denver, they're gonna be in like the top 15 probably. After oh, this I know, game. I know. And uh, so uh, we have some other good news um, out of Connecticut and uh, that is uh, Cornell University ended up beating Quinnipiac one zip. Which is crazy because Quinnipiac is a top five team <laughs> in, in the nation. And they, sh they honestly showed it minus the scoreboard. They outshot the uh, Cornell 42, 42 to 18. I know. And so that just comes tough. And I mean, Cornell capitalized on their power plays. Power plays and special teams are the biggest things that separate these top teams in the country. Yep. If you can capitalize at the right moment. And you know what? Cornell only managed two shots in the third period and still held on to a win. Hats off to their goalie, uh, the Ian Shane. Yep, looking like a top tier goalie. If he's hot right now and he can string a couple wins together for them, Cornell's looking at that at large bid. Yes, they are. Now, I got off the phone just before we came on the air with the general manager from Cornell University, and he basically told me that they're, they're front line and they've been injured all year. Now, also, too, their coach has not been on the bench since December, their head coach. He's had some medical issues, uh, some problems with clotting, and COVID. He caught COVID. So he is not even traveling with the team. Um, he said that the team is firing on all cylinders. They are now in New Jersey getting ready to take on Princeton tonight. 
Princeton is no slouch of a team by any stretch of the imagination. So we'll look for another really, really close nail biter for Cornell University. And let's see if they can pull out a win and get a sweep for this weekend's uh, games, which is what they really need going into the ECAC tournament. Yeah, and I think we saw that with St. Cloud State a little bit too. I mean, you're missing your head coach, even though he's not on the ice, he's your leader. He's the one that's setting, up, drawing up the plays. I mean, Big time. very instrumental in you winning the game. So, I mean, the fact that Cornell is figuring it out right now without him and they're getting healthy at the right yeah. time, hopefully it's not too late and they're gonna make that push for that out-large bid. Yeah, so the ECAC tournament basically is gonna be, they play it on whoever's, uh, it's 12 teams, four top teams get bi get buys. So Cornell feels like they're gonna get a buy. And then it's a tournament of eight teams basically at that point in time. So you win three and you win the ECACs. If Cornell can get to the finals of the ECAC, I think they'll get an at-large bid. Yeah. They don't have to necessarily win it. Yeah, exactly. They have some quality wins now uh, on their resume, and I don't see why they wouldn't get in. Um, we had St. Cloud State. Uh, actually, they, we said that uh, they were coming here, but actually Colorado College yeah. went there, yeah. which gives St. Cloud State an advantage. A lot of people don't know this, but Herb Brooks, Miracle Coach, uh, he's the one that gave St. Cloud State their program, and we play on olympic size ice, where most teams play on nhl size ice. So there is a difference in the size of the arena, so speed helps. So the arena is bigger on the olympic size arena, right? Yeah, so our, our ice sheet is bigger than what the apps play on. Right, so there's right. less room, there's more room to skate around. And being back home really helped. St. Cloud State's desperate to get on track. Uh, they've had a couple bad losses here coming near the end of the season, not the time to take them. Uh, especially with this NCHC conference where over three-fourths of the team are in the top 20 uh, in the country, there's no guarantee you're winning this tournament. Like, it, no matter how good DU does, there's no guarantee they're going to win the tournament. I mean, you have North Dakota, Duluth, and everything. So they brought in Colorado College, and they ended up handling them 4-1. to one. Uh, you can really tell it. Sam Hench has got on the board twice, who was over on the Olympics. Yep. And Nick Parabix got on the assist board. So both the Olympic players contributed to the win. Yeah, they got over their jet lag from China. Yeah. Thank God. And, and so they really needed this, especially after that sweep uh, that where they just got swept by Nebraska-Omaha. Overall, it was actually a pretty even game. It was just St. Cloud State capitalized on their power plays. Mm -hmm. And so, what were well, the shots? Uh, what were the number of shots? Did you have that? I didn't write that one down for this That's game. A, no, they they no were worries. pretty even, though. It was something like twenty-five to thirty. So mm -hmm. overall, back and forth game. Right. Um, but yeah, St. Cloud needs this win not mm -hmm. only to move up a little bit, so maybe they get an easier opponent first round. Because if they get eliminated first round, they are in jeopardy of not making the tournament. Uh, they're sitting at the eleven seed right now. So tonight's another big game for them. They're going to host Colorado College again. They need the sweep. I'm thinking they're going to get it done, but we'll just have to wait and see tonight. Yeah, you remember they're 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 uh, basically playing on their home ice though, so that's going to help them. And just as you said, especially with the extra area, the surface area of the ice, and being able to skate because they're so fast. Yeah, they really are. And that's where you see St. Cloud State get in trouble sometimes. When we're at home, we get to really exploit our speed, and I'm pretty sure we recruit based on speed a lot of the time. But when we get to the bigger tournaments and we're playing on the NHL size ice, speed isn't as big of a factor as it is on these big sheets of ice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What else you got for us? Any other any yeah. other games? So another top game, two top 10 teams, North Dakota versus Western Michigan. Now this is kind of like the Cornell Quinnipiac game. Mm -hmm. North Dakota got outplayed, but they pulled off the win two to one. The one thing I like about this North Dakota team is it doesn't matter the way the game flow is going. This North Dakota team just can turn it on at any moment. So they could be getting out shot 10 to zero. They're gonna come down and score on you. This team is dangerous and I really think they're gonna make a run at the championship at well this year. They just have everything going for them. Their star forward right now is dealing with an injury, but should be uh, back in time for the tournament. Excellent, excellent. Well, good. And then we have one last one, don't we? Or is that it for the That's college? it for college. Good. Okay, let's go into the uh, the Avalanche and what they did and what they pulled off here in Denver, Colorado at Ball Arena. Yeah. Go ahead, Seth. Yeah, last night, the ass came out flat. It did not look good in the first period. They were outshot to begin with. The, uh, the Winnipeg Jets got a couple early goals. Down 3 nothing after the first. I actually looked at that score line and I was like, Oh my God, we're in trouble. This we're gonna lose. We came back and scored six straight goals. Captain Gabriel Landeskog put on a hat trick. McKinnon added a goal. 
overall, it just shows our depth again. I just keep talking about the depth of this Colorado Avalanche team, the resilience of this Colorado Avalanche team. A lot of teams can get deflated, go down 3 nothing, and it's just over. And, and, you, and the fans out there, okay, mm -hmm. the Twitter fans of Denver, okay, and Colorado Rocky Mountain region, my goodness, I could not believe what I was reading. Now, I know that Twitter is not really, you know, a real cross-sectional view, but boy, there were so many haters out there. And you know what? You guys all, hopefully you ate a nice big sandwich, you haters out there, because never count this team out. Well, I think it just goes to show we've played all season. Our goal differential, so goals for and goals against, they do the subtraction. Sure. We're number one in the NHL in goal differential. Right. We're number two in scoring goals, so we have the offense. We're number 11 in goals against, but overall it's the best combo in the NHL of goals for, goals against. And so that just goes to how balanced we are as a team. And I just think right now with the young players we have coming in, and how they're handling themselves. I don't see a lot of teams beating us. They do have a big test tonight, though. Yeah. We just came off an emotional win against the Winnipeg, sure. making that awesome comeback. Vegas Golden Knights, team that eliminated us last yeah. year, they're, coming to town. They're good. They're good, and they, they seem to have our number. Uh, you know, they definitely did last year. Yeah, and they, they've made some adjustments. So I keep talking about the rumor mill that the Avs are going to add a late uh, veteran to the season. Claude Giroux is the name that's been floating around. Don't know if we're going to come to agreement in time. But Jack Eichel used to be uh, Eichel used to be captain of the Buffalo Sabres. Oh, wow. And he now is on the Vegas Golden Knights to add some firepower mm -hmm. to him. So the record doesn't mean anything in this matchup. There's a lot of emotion going because... We've ran into Vegas quite a bit lately, yeah, and yeah. Uh, I really think we're in for a good game tonight. Hopefully, the Avs can't afford to start like they did last night. No, no. If they do, I, it'll be tough for them. But I'm hoping that they've got the momentum going, and uh, you know, you'll see them jump out to maybe a one or two goal, you know, first period, which yeah. would really be nice. It's been, go off the momentum of the last two periods that yep. you just played. Forget about the first period that you played and come in hot, Vegas. They're coming here, so it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out tonight. But I'm giving the edge to us. Nathan McKinnon's back. We don't really have a lot of injuries. Uh, Kemper is playing like a Stanley Cup goalie. Uh, he's up there. He's in the top five, I believe, in save percentage. And goals against average, I think he's sitting at 10th. But overall, he averages giving up two goals a game. Our team averages four goals a game. That's a winning combination. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Excellent. You got the Wild, too, right? Yeah. Can we talk about the Wild a little bit? So the Wild are currently sitting fourth in okay. the West, uh, Western Conference. So not our division. They're number two in our division. In our division, division, yeah. But, like, over for the Western Conference where they take the top eight teams, they're sitting fourth. Now, it's not a real fourth because they haven't played as many games. Uh, they run into that in hockey where the Avs, I think, now are on game uh, 53 is tonight. And for the Wild, it's going to be game 50. Uh, no matter what, we have a big lead on them. But Calgary holds a one-point lead over the Wild, and they're going to play twice in a row. Now, this game is going to be very interesting. Kirill Kaprasov for Minnesota. He's, he's going to be the franchise player. They built around him. He just puts up great offense, creates plays. He, honestly, one of the best up-and-coming NHLers I've seen in a long time. Wow. And Calgary, <coughs> I don't understand how they're doing it. They're nine and one in their last ten games. Yep. They are red hot right now. Yep. So we're gonna see, and the Abs are only five, or the Abs, the Wild are five and five. So right now they're going in opposite trajectories. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Calgary sweep this. Interesting. And, and Minnesota dropping farther down the standings as we get farther down the season. Yep. And you know, again, we want to remind everybody we're we're basically at the midway point of the hockey season. There's so much hockey still to be played. So really, you know, we're looking at trends, we're looking at streaks, we're looking at overall play, but there's nothing to panic about. And even if we were to end up losing three or four straight, um, you know, there's plenty of time for them to right the ship. So we really just want to hope that we don't have injuries, right? The, yeah, and the ads did it right. So the big thing of what you'll talk to any NHL analyst is going to basically be, you got to get your wins early. Mm -hmm. Because as the season goes on, as teams gel, at the beginning of the season, you could have five, ten new players due to trades. You could you, you change throughout the year, and it's about getting that right uh, chemistry going for your team. So Jack uh, Eichel right now for Vegas, he's probably not a hundred percent 
with their team. It's a whole new different scheme. Uh, the coach probably has a, a couple different tactics that he uses that Buffalo never used. But it's going to be interesting because coming down to these last, it's really hard to get on big streaks because everybody gets their chemistry dialed in and games get tougher. So the ads are sitting pretty for how well they've done early in the season. And we'll see how the last 30 games pan out for them. Absolutely. Well, good. All right, so the next thing that we want to talk about is, is we're, we're kind of transitioning from hockey and we're going to start integrating some college basketball in. And, you know, without going into all the details, because it's a little premature, um, we do want to talk about what slate is on TV today. And remember, all these games, any of these games that I'm going to mention, you can watch live down here at Brothers this afternoon. Mm -hmm. We've got a game that's already in, uh, it's in progress. We've got number four, Purdue versus Michigan State. That started at 10 p.m. So that's probably getting pretty close right now to halftime. Uh, number six, Kentucky plays number 18, Arkansas, at noon today. That, that's going to be a really good game. I mean, Arkansas is tough. You know Arkansas um, knocked off number one Auburn earlier this season, and everybody stormed the court. You've got number three Auburn versus number 17 Tennessee. Auburn's a tough squad, and Tennessee is really starting to surge. The game that I really want to focus on is Duke versus Syracuse. Duke is traveling to upstate New York and will be playing in the Carrier Dome. Again, the Carrier Dome, like we said in our preview, can seat up to 30 to 31,000 people. That's a big stadium. It's huge. And, uh, you know, they don't have these stadiums anymore. The domes have really gone the way of the Dodo Bird, and you don't really have them anymore. So this is a great opportunity for people, you know, to see a game. And, and, and if you watch it on TV, it starts at 4 p.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time. You'll get a chance to see really what it's like to play in front of 20, probably just be 27, 28,000, maybe more that are going to show up at this game because this is the biggest game. This is the game that everybody is excited for in upstate New York. And you got the Bayheim brothers. And Seth, you, I, I saw and I read a little bit of your stuff here. Tell us a little bit about what you've got for this game. Yeah, so Syracuse, they got trounced by Duke earlier this season. January 22nd when it happened. Ended up losing by somewhere around 20 points. Yeah. It actually wasn't even that close to begin no. with. Duke ran away in the first half. Uh, but the big thing is Buddy Beheim is going to have to have a big game. Mm -hmm. He's leading them in scoring. Uh, around 19 points per game. That's great. Uh, but he's going to have to come off. Syracuse is a different team at home. They are 11-3. and three. If you actually go by the record, they they honestly have just over a winning record. But at home, they are unstoppable. Yeah. So we're, I'm looking for a completely different game this time. But Paolo Benchero, honestly, he's up for basically being the number one draft pick. I don't think he will be. I think he'll be top five at least. Yeah. But he's only averaging about 15 points, still dealing with cramping issues. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Paolo Banchero sweats eight pounds of uh, water weight per game, wow. and they had to give him a special liquid so he would stop cramping up. Wow, uh, It's kind of affected Duke's season a little bit. I mean, it hasn't really cost them any games. When they beat Gonzaga, uh, Paolo had over, um, he had like over 20 points in the first half, but he cramped up most of the second half and wasn't able to play. Right. Uh, so I'm looking, I, I'm going to say Duke's going to win this one, but... Duke right now is playing. They're sitting at about a two seed. We'll see if they can get to that one seed here with their ACC tournament with a couple quality wins. They still have North Carolina on the schedule. Yes, they do. But if Syracuse can pull off this win, there is no reason that Syracuse does not make this tournament. Yeah, it's going to really help them. And, yeah. and this is something that we need to see. And the other thing with Syracuse, with, with their, their, their record that they have right now, they're going to need to go a couple games deep in the ACC tournament. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to keep Syracuse out because, you know, there's just such uh, following and stuff like that. So we're going to hope and, and pray that they get a, you know, a 12 seed or better. Yeah. Um, that would really be nice to see. Uh, one other game that we were going to talk about, and, and you have another game on here. I, have, too. I was going to highlight a little bit of Purdue. Yeah, Michigan let's talk State. a little bit about Purdue. So Purdue I had Michigan this State. as an upset. I just mm -hmm. did a score update. Did uh, you? Michigan State is up by seven over number four Purdue, and Ooh. Michigan State is not that good this year. They're still in the first half, though, right? Still in the first half, okay. but Michigan State is sitting at an eighteen and nine record. The Big mm -hmm. Ten has been tough this year. Um, yeah, they any are. one of these teams can go down at any time. Spartans are a lot like Syracuse. They're ten and three at home. Mm -hmm. Hard to beat there. 
And so if Michigan State can get this win, they're, they're basically in. And Tom Izzo's team always makes a push at the end of the year. Yeah, he's such a good coach. Yeah, and so I love bringing up Tom Izzo just because he did – he played like a charity game. Uh, it wasn't a charity, it was an exhibition. But he took on St. Cloud State back in the day because oh, nice. his uh, nephew happened to be on St. Cloud State. They blew us out by like 50. <laughs> but uh, overall, just a great guy. I was really happy to see Michigan State took their time to play a Division II opponent uh, to give us yeah. experience. And just, you know, it was a tune-up game for his guys, but uh, just a lot of respect for Tom Izzo. Well, let me so. tell you something, okay? So Syracuse does that. They play some of the Sisters of the Poor, we call them. And uh, they took on a crosstown rival, Division II Lemoyne. And this was about, I don't know, I would say about seven, eight, maybe ten years ago. And Lemoyne beat them, okay, in the dome. And, uh, boy, I mean, that was a big bragging right for Lemoyne. Now, we used to play Lemoyne. Lemoyne was one of our regular opponents. We usually played them two or three times a year at Mansfield. For a Lemoyne team to beat a Syracuse team, I mean, they had bragging rights that whole summer that they were the best team in Syracuse, mm -hmm. you know, because they had beaten Syracuse. So you got to be careful, you know. And uh, University of Virginia back in the 80s took on a Chaminade team, which is a team out of Hawaii. And number one with Ralph Sampson and all the boys, um, they ended up getting beat by Chaminade, which was a Division II team. So it isn't unheard of. And college basketball, the best thing about it is you never know. And it's like on any given day, you can have some people that just end up playing way above their heads and mm -hmm. other teams that just go cold. Uh, the last game that uh, I want to bring your attention is an 8 p.m. start, Mountain Standard Time. It's number one, Gonzaga is playing against their big rival, St. Mary's. And uh, that should be an interesting game. St. Mary's always plays the Zags tough. There's just something about that rivalry. The two teams hate each other. Um, and uh, it's gonna be really interesting to watch that game, even if it's a, if it's a 123 matchup. So. Yeah, and like the, the players to watch in this one, like Jeff Tim has been there forever. Yes. And he, so he's gonna play, it, play out. He's gonna have a great game. But the player I'm curious about, Mitch Holmgren, you're a freshman, amazing player. For those of you who don't know him, he came from, I believe he came from Apple Valley, Minnesota. But he is a 7'2 guy that can shoot threes. Oh, he's, he's a good. freshman. He's and so good. So I'm really looking to see how he responds to these high-pressure rivalry games. Because, mm -hmm. you know, 18 years old. Uh, it, you never know how they're going to respond. Is oh, yeah. it going to crumble and kind of fall behind? Yep. And Jeff's going to have to take over the team? Or... Is he going to show out and he's going to be the star? Um, right now, people have him picked as a, again, a top five draft pick. Uh, people at the beginning of the year were saying a number one draft pick. Do you think he's going to be a one and done? Um, it's going to be interesting because Gonzaga does not usually no. uh, do those things. Uh, a lot of teams like Duke, Kentucky's the one that started it. But a lot of teams like Duke now are one and done. It's really hard to get those sophomore juniors to stay at Duke because they know they're going to go in the first round. Now, I don't know, uh, is there any way that this is affected by college players being able to be paid now? Will they actually stay? Oh, that's a good, that's a really good point. And one thing cool is, is I've spent some time in Spokane, which is where Gonzaga is located. Those guys are rock stars, okay? And Eastern, the entire part of Eastern Washington into Montana, over in Coeur d'Alene, these guys, when they go and when they come into town, they are treated like superstars. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if that makes any difference. Now, one thing about that freshman that you were just mentioning, he needs to get some weight. Yeah, okay? he is if, if he goes and plays in the NBA, he is going to get the crap kicked out of him unless he can put on some bulk because he's skinny. And, you know, he's seven foot two, so he's going to fill out. I mean, I don't know if many of you guys remember watching Shaq play when he was at LSU. I got a chance to watch him personally. Shaq became a very, very big man. Now, he wasn't, he wasn't, you know, huge when he was at LSU, but boy, he became, you know, when he put on the weight and the, and the muscle, I mean, he's a, he's a house. But I think it all comes down to where you're going to get drafted because here's the thing. I'll bring up Tyus Jones from Duke. Right. He definitely was not ready to go pro. He shouldn't even have really been, a, in my opinion, he should not have been a first-round draft pick at the time. 
but he showed out in the ACC tournament. He had a great March Madness and got MVP for Duke. In the, he got MVP in the ACC tournament, mm -hmm. and then he had a great showing in the March Madness. And they put him in the first round. They put him in like a top 10 pick. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going to go with that, is he going to get better? Is he going to actually be able to raise his stock? Sure. I don't think he was ever going to get to raise his stock. So he had to go. That was going to be the biggest payday he was ever going to get. So it's really going to come down to some of these players for one and dones. Where are you going to go? If, if you're a second round pick and you think you can do better, you're going to stay. But if you're a top five pick, there's no reason to stay. No, because your your rookie contract's going to take care of you for the rest of your life. Yeah. The bad thing about it is, is that you know, playing in the D League, the de developmental league, is no picnic. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, uh, I, I've seen Syracuse players leave way early. And uh, you know, Johnny Doc or uh, it was Johnny. Um, he went and played in Minnesota. Johnny Flynn. Johnny Flynn. Perfect example. You know. Worst pick ever. Sorry, well, but was. No, no. He he was a sophomore when he came out. Okay. He could have stayed for two more years and been the you know the to the toast of the uh, ACC Big East back then was where they were part of, they were playing out of. Instead, he leaves. He was what a number five, number six draft pick, yeah. and he just didn't make it. And see, the reason I say it's the worst draft pick ever. So Minnesota fans will remember this for the rest of their yep. lives. We took Johnny Flynn because he had the crazy three overtime winner and yep. brought Syracuse to victory. And then we took Ricky Rubio. Right after that, Steph Curry was drafted. Yeah. Minnesota cut ahead Steph Curry. Yeah. And we don't. And look at Steph Curry now. But no one could have predicted him being as good as he is. But 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 you're right. It's a woulda, coulda, shoulda. I mean, it's the same thing when Michael Jordan came out. He was the number three pick. Mm -hmm. And the two guys that were ahead of him, you know, in the 84 draft, Ralph Sampson didn't really pan out that well. And uh, there was another gentleman that went to the Portland Trailblazers who was a complete bust. Yeah. So, you know, even Michael Jordan, the greatest of the great, um, you know, I, I think, and I consider him to be the GOAT, people didn't know that he, he didn't come out number one. Well, and I feel like that's a weird thing to, like, we have so many scouts that are supposed to predict if you're going to be know. good. But look at Tom Brady. Let's go to the NFL. Sixth round draft yeah, sixth pick. Sixth round draft pick. Yep. And now he's the Hall of Fame best quarterback of all time statistically. Like, it is just crazy to see how wrong we get it sometimes. And I think a lot of it is it's really hard to judge character and it's really hard to judge how you overcome obstacles because Tom Brady overcame a lot, Michael Jordan overcame a lot. Yep. Uh, Steph Curry, I mean, he, he's a different breed. He's a freak of nature. He, he didn't overcome anything. He, no. just, he just was amazing they, from the They just had a thing on Barstool Sports this morning that I saw and he was throwing uh, a football around the basketball arena. I mean, the guy is just what you call a natural athlete. If anybody has ever seen him golf, he's like a scratch golfer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, I mean, he, the, he, he, uh, his side gig <laughs> is he runs a holy moly. Great yeah. show. If you get a chance to watch, kind of comical. They have comedians as the announcers. But it's a mini golf show. Yeah. And, and, he, and he's, a, he's a wonder. I mean, I watched him play in that celebrity tournament they have in, mm -hmm. uh, in, it's not in Reno, but it's up in Lake Tahoe every year. And I'm watching the guy swing, and, and he swings like a professional golfer. Yeah. Um, there's just people out there, and I know a couple people. There's a friend of mine in, in Denver. I'll mention his name. is Dakota Nam. He's a phenomenal athlete. He played uh, third base for Metro. And, um, I mean, I've never seen a ping pong player as good as him. I, I mean, he, he ridiculous. And you, you give Dakota anything to do. And uh, he's just a wonderful athlete. He ended up winning a state championship as a point guard for Thomas Jefferson High School back in 2005. There's just these freak of nature people that you come across in your life, and you just sit there as another athlete and look at them and go, how can they be so good at so many sports? Yeah, and I, yeah. Think, I think a lot of it comes <laughs> down to it, too. It's, it's hard. Uh, you, you always take risks. Uh, Greg Oden was a great college basketball player. And he when, beat he, up though. when he, he got when he when he got to the NBA, he never could really play because he's injured the whole he time. He hit his injury. Yeah, and, he, and and Ohio State hit his injury. Yeah, but like it comes down to like people like we look at uh, Taco Smalls. He was a freaky nature, but there is some some weird thing. And I'm kind of bringing it back to Mitch Holmgren. There is a thing. It's too tall. Uh, there's a lot of leg injuries with these guys that get into bowl. the seven. Yep, <laughs> they, they always get injured, and so it's really hard. 
to predict. Now, if they stay healthy, they're going to dominate and they're going to be very beneficial for your team. Yeah. But if they can't be on the court, yeah. I mean, it's just a risk. And Well, Bol Bol, his son, is playing uh, for the Nuggets. I don't know if he's on the active roster, but Bol Bol is Manuk Bol's son. And, uh, yeah, he's he's in, he's a, a part of the Denver Nuggets. I'm not sure whether he's sitting the bench. I knew he had an injury, so he, they may have actually moved him down to the D-League to rehab. But uh, he's another individual that's seven foot plus. And, uh, you know, he wasn't uh, very, very, uh, didn't have a lot of muscles, you know, when he came into the league. And I'll tell you what, you play 81 games against these guys in the NBA, you better have some kind of bulk. Now, I you're... believe Bobo is not on our team. He's anymore. not now? So we, Wait, he, he was, though, he wasn't was, he? He was, but he was part of the Aaron Gordon trade. Oh, he did. Oh, he got traded. Okay. And so okay. I, I thought he was. I just had a – I pulled yep. it up with our uh, producer over here. Yeah, yeah. Good and, thing. Good uh, thing. Good thing we but, have our fat checker over but, there. But, yeah, so he uh, – I did remember he got traded because I was really upset that he was traded because I love – uh, players like him, like Taco Smalls, when he played Zion, when, when he played fucking, uh, oops, probably shouldn't drop the F bomb, but when he played Zion Williams a podcast, in, right. in, um, in March Madness, Zion flew up in the air. I don't even think Taco jumped, and he was able to grab it for UC, UCF over his head. So, I mean, like, these huge players are fun to watch. Where is Taco now? Is Taco, he still in the NBA? He was in Boston last time I checked. Okay, so he's still he's a journeyman. You know, he's making the, his, his rounds and stuff. And, you know, a lot of these guys, I mean, a perfect example, and this is something that we haven't talked about that we need to talk about, is Juwan Howard and what he did last week. Oh, weekend. yeah, let's go into that. Exactly. Against now, Wisconsin. Ex yes. Juwan Howard was a journeyman. He came out as a very high draft pick. And he ended up playing for multiple teams. He won two NBA championships with the Miami Heat. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk a little bit about what are your feelings on, on him reaching over and, and basically bitch slapping the, the Wisconsin coach? So, I mean, I feel like it was a very emotional moment for him. He had just lost the game. Um, but they got crushed. He felt it was disrespectful that Wisconsin called a timeout yeah. near the end of the game. Now, the Wisconsin coach had walked over to him after he realized he was, like, he didn't I shake saw him his in the hands. line. They, yeah. Yeah, and so he went over and he said, like, hey, like, if you thought I did something disrespectful, that wasn't what I was trying to do. Now, is he using these words? No. He probably said it way more sarcastic and probably sure. instigated it more. But... He, he's like, hey, let me explain to you why I took the timeout. And what he's saying is he took the timeout because he didn't like his players on the floor. The game was over. He wanted to switch players out. Right. And, I mean, but the issue that Howard has is it wasn't putting your bench players in. He put in some starters when they were already blowing them out. And they were. They were up by, uh, I don't know if it was 19 or 20 points, but yeah. the game was well over. So he took exception. But here's my thing, and you can maybe feel different about me. And th this is my favorite one. It's when I saw, I think it was a football team won by 56. It was, hey, you have the, you're supposed to be a good team. You're so, we, we all draft, we all recruit. So we're going to play our best players and we're going to play. If you're right. going to lose, you're going to lose. If you don't like it, play better. Yep. And so yep. do I hate what Wisconsin did? Not really. Do I think Michigan should have played better? 100%. And sure. You know what? If they want to run up the score on you, at the end of the day, you should do everything you can to stop it. But I agree. But you remember back when Spurrier was at Florida in the 90s? Mm -hmm. I mean, Spurrier has a very cocky at, you know, demeanor about him. But he would come in, and they would, they would try to score 70 points. And he did not care. I yeah. mean, he was throwing the ball right down the last two minutes. They're up 73 to nothing. Or 73 to 7 and he's still throwing the ball down the field and a lot of people took exception to that back in the day now he came to South Carolina and he was our coach there it took me a good two years to warm up to this guy um, I still didn't like him from what he did and what he pulled when he was in Florida you know what looking back on it I you know I, I don't know why he ran the score up the way he did but you're right if you're a team and you schedule a team and you're down by 70 points, so be it. You know, I there's mean, no we, mercy rule in the NCAAs. I, I just, okay, honestly, men's sports are probably the biggest crybabies about it. Nobody, <laughs> no. nobody said anything about Connecticut when they just got their star back uh, yeah. last night. Uh, who were they playing? St. John's? Mm -hmm. 
beat them by like 65 points, but nobody's talking about that. The the girls team didn't cry, the coaches didn't get in a fight. Yeah. They got outplayed, they got outclassed, and that's just it. And I'm okay with it, especially in college, because yeah. when you're working for an at-large bid, or you're working on rankings and they're looking at quality of wins, we're looking at deficits too. We're looking at how well. Oklahoma was undefeated for the longest time this year, and they were getting uh, just kind of, I wouldn't say embarrassed, but no respect right. and getting put in the 7, 8, 9 speed, even though they were one of like the last three teams undefeated. Why? Because their wins were only by a touchdown. Now, if they blew everyone up by 50, now we're putting them at 1 and 2. Right. It does affect rankings. So you know what? Put up as many points as you can. Get all these credibility points going yep. down. Yep. I agree. And it helps with your rank. Well, I agree. And, and that's the same thing, too, with Wisconsin. I mean, they're in the Big Ten. It's a very competitive league. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Juwan Howard really, and, and he only got a week suspension. I mean, and, and, and I was looking at his bio. Last year, he was the coach of the year in the Big Ten. Yeah. Maybe that's what's saving him. I don't know. But if he had hit a player like that, I guarantee you he would have been done for the rest of his career, just like Woody Hayes. When Woody Hayes, who was a legend at Ohio State, hit that Clemson player, it was done. Woody Page was, or Woody Page, Woody Hayes, not Woody Page. Woody Page, we love Woody Page. He's here <laughs> in Denver. He's from around the horn, fame on ESPN, and he's a Denver resident. We are going to get him on our show. I can't wait to, I, 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 you know, he lives in a gated community or I'd be knocking on his door. Because <laughs> he used to drink beer with me, and he's a good guy. But Woody Hayes, his career was done, and he put his hands on a college player. Uh, Juwan Howard, I'm telling you, man, you know, you got yourself a premier job. You took over for Jim Beeline, or John Beeline, and John Beeline built that Michigan program into a, a national power. You've got the keys to a Ferrari. Let's hope you don't end up, you know, crap yeah, in the and, bed. And I don't even know why he was that mad. I mean, part yeah, of it... Yeah, I, I don't either. It might just be because he had so much success, and this year hasn't really turned out for him. Because, I mean... Uh, well, he doesn't have Beeline's recruits anymore. It was either last week or two weeks ago. Yeah. You were sitting you were sitting here at Brothers, enjoying a nice cold beverage. And I looked up, and North Carolina, uh, North Carolina was playing Florida State. They were up by almost 40 points in the first half. Yep. And you know what? They ended up winning by 30 or 40. And it's just like, at that point, North Carolina's playing for seeding. And you know what? Florida State didn't throw a fit. So oh. it, it's probably just a frustrating year for him. Uh, he's really got to coach up these guys because, you know, Michigan is a power powerhouse. They always have been. They've always been in the mention. And this year, nothing special. Well, and I'm telling you, we're going to find out what Juwan Howard is made of as a coach and his recruits. Because I'm telling you, now granted he took over I believe in 18. Um, so he's had now basically three, four seasons. But Beeline, Beeline is an incredible recruiter. Let me, trust me, he recruited me. I'll tell you what, I was signed, sealed, and delivered to go to Lemoyne. And uh, I loved, I loved him. Matter of fact, I worked his camp for two summers because I wanted to be as close to him as possible. I had a funny feeling that he had a great basketball mind. And you have to remember that after he left Lemoyne, which was Division II, he went to Canisius. He had tremendous success at Canisius. He then went to Richmond. He had great success there, bounced over to West Virginia. West Virginia made it to the Final Eight a couple times, and then finally got the Michigan job and turned that Michigan program around and ended up making it to the final game twice and was a national runner-up twice. Yeah, and I mean this, uh, it, it's just, uh, it's gonna be a growing pain. Big 10 is always a tough division to come out of. It really uh, is, and it's tough this year, and I, I'm loving it. I'm really happy to see Big 10 basketball back to where it, it used to be. Um, ACC this year is not as strong as they've been in the past. Um, you know, the Syracuse and, and stuff like that, the mid-range teams really aren't as tough this year. Again, Duke, we can't help but mention this is going to be Coach K's last ACC tournament. Mm -hmm. It's going to be his last NCAA tournament. We're sorry to see him go, but he's got a pretty good squad, so let's see what he can do yeah. and see if they can make a run. I think Coach K is built for success for this. Uh, I mean, early predictions has them being in the same side as Gonzaga in the tournament. Now that could Ooh. change because, you know, they haven't picked yet. But it's going to be very interesting to see what his road is uh, ACC tournament-wise. They are the number one team in the ACC followed closely by Notre Dame. But 
I just give the edge to Duke winning the ACC, and we'll see how the tournament lies. Because you know what? There's always those crazy teams like Loyola Chicago, Davidson. Yep. All those teams we don't talk about all year that when we hit this tournament, they get on fire and they, they make do. the run to like at least the Elite Eight. There's always one Cinderella team. Yep, exactly. So we're, we're gearing up. Next week's uh, broadcast will be, we'll be, we'll be delving into some of the personnel, some of the great players that are in the top ten of the, uh, the NCAA tournaments and stuff like that. And of course, we'll be covering championship week. We want to invite you guys to come down to Brothers Bar and Grill here at the Shops of Northfield. Seth, what do we got going on today for drink specials? So right now we're still highlighting our $5 Vegas Bombs, our $5 Bush Lights, and our four fifty dollars Ultras. Uh, and I believe we have a pitcher special as well for the original Long Islands. They are amazing. They are $10 as well. And overall, we're going to have college basketball going the whole time. Uh, little sneak peek for next week. Uh, on Tuesday, we are revamping our whole patio. We're going to have cornhole. We're going to get the games Sweet. out. We're going to really make this a fun location so that you can bring the Good. family. Or And we have patio TVs. So if you want to go play yard games and still watch the, the game, yes. we have that for you. Oh, and, and the patio here, folks, it's a wraparound patio. And it is just, it, not only is it big, but there's, there's uh, ski lift. Uh, chairs that mm -hmm. you have out there that are really kind of nice for the aesthetic, uh, you know, the aesthetic value. Um, you're sitting right across from Harkin Theater, so you've got you know the buzz of people walking by. The shops at Northfield. If you haven't been here, you really should come down and check it out. And Brothers is the cornerstone restaurant and bar of this whole area. Oh yeah, it, it was packed last night. If you got, if some of you guys got to make it out here last night, it was a full bar, a fun place to be at. Uh, we threw the best party last night, and we're going to do it again tonight. Uh, I get If you're looking for a fun time, I don't care if you're from out of town, I don't care if you live in the neighborhood, Brothers is the place to be. You come down anytime. You can drive past any of these other bars, and you know what? A little bit slower. Over at Brothers, we, we're always rocking with the best sports. We always have the best party and the best drink specials in the entire area. And the best staff. Let yeah. me tell you, their staff is second to none. In the restaurant industry, if you can keep somebody for a year, you're doing really well. Seth has people that have been here for five, six, seven years. Yeah. Now that tells you something. That tells you about something about the, the, the volume of business they do here. It also tells about the, about the infrastructure of, of how it's run. So definitely come down, you know, get your, go sit and, and, and let somebody serve you and let us put the TVs on the game that you want to see. Yeah. So we got lots of college hockey too. Remember, we've got the plus, the ESPN plus, so we can mm -hmm. see that. So excellent. Well, listen, um, our second portion of our show is going to get real interesting. We're going to talk a little bit about women's soccer and their settlement of 24 million. We're also going to talk a little bit about Phil Mickelson, and uh, good old Phil kind of put his foot in his mouth. Um, he was speaking off the record. He thought, well, he has to understand that there's no such thing anymore as speaking off the record. There's too many people that have cell phones and recordings, and you may think that you're talking off the record, but boy, I'm telling you, you say the wrong thing, and you can be canceled really quickly. Yeah. He's lost a ton of sponsors. We're going to get into that. Um, and we're going to talk in depth about women's soccer, about some of the equity issues in pay, and uh, it'll kind of dovetail uh, the WNBA discussion we had when we were talking about Becky Hammond and uh, the Las Vegas Aces. So come back and see us. Yeah, and we're one last thing, we are gonna talk a little bit about the new roster changes that the US women are doing. Is it good for us or should we let our champions keep going? Excellent, come on back now.